In this exciting episode, Perry encounters an attractive and trespassing female P.I. who has her own saxophone theme. The only surprise? Paul never asked the lady out on a date. Maybe he's got ethical standards. It's season two, episode 29 of Perry Mason, The Case of the Dubious Bridegroom. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do a pod for every episode of the television series, and as time permits, I'll look at some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each episode, I'll give a brief refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia, as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself, and then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler, where just like Perry, Della, and Paul... We can rehash the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the law library! Each episode in the law library, we return to prior cases to refresh our memories about Perry's past so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. The subject of today's library visit Pleading the Fifth Amendment. It comes up in this joke Della makes after Perry's name appears in the local papers. What prominent lawyer got out of line with a beautiful blonde in front of his office last night? And why did the BB sprint to the nearest taxi for a fast exit? Considering the clues, even we could solve this mystery. May I remind you that you may stand on the Fifth Amendment? This isn't quite foreshadowing from Della, but the climactic trial scenes of this episode do feature an almost Fifth Amendment invocation. Again, it's conspicuous that the episode's rogue P.I. doesn't plead the Fifth. Just exactly who were you working for? I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. You mean you refuse to answer? Yes. Would the court please instruct this witness to answer the question? Is the witness conversant with her constitutional rights? Yes, Your Honor. If necessary, I'm prepared to go to jail for contempt rather than divulge confidence given by a client. Just a note here. I don't think we've had any Fifth Amendment pleading in the show yet. I do wonder if the writers ever debated having someone invoke the Fifth Amendment at the end of an episode, a kind of circumstantial proof of the person's guilt without the person screaming, I did it! Note, the guilty party in this episode never says, I did it! Out loud. He could have pled the Fifth. Let's close the loop and say that Perry never invokes the fifth. Let the papers print what they want. Perry's got justice on his side. Now, let's get to the plot of this episode. The case of the dubious bridegroom. Perry's working late. It's a tough job, but somebody has to do it. No Della either. I don't see a giant tome on his desk. Might he be penning his anonymous newsletter on bachelor life in L.A.? Gossip litters the front page of the local papers, as we soon find out. But suddenly, Perry hears something. And we hear something, too. A saxophone. We see something as well, an attractive blonde in a dress tiptoeing into Perry's office from the terrace with a gun. Perry captures her. She ditches the gun, says it's a flashlight, then proceeds to weave a tale of intrigue. I was on my way back in when I saw the door opening. 
But it wasn't Mr. Garvin. Mrs. Garvin? However, did you know? The important thing is, how did she know? She's the jealous type. So discretion forced you to leave by the terrace? It's the only way I could get to my car. And naturally, you needed a gun for protection. It was a flashlight. Though it's clear Perry doesn't buy her rap, he does get taken in by her once they're on the street. She pretends to faint, lures Perry in so it looks like he's a masher, and the next thing you know, he's in the newspaper. Slow news day in L.A., huh? Della loves it. You look tired. Worked late last night. Well, the mysterious woman turns out to be a liar. How do we know? Ed Garvin, the man the woman said she worked for, consults Perry basically after Perry discovers he's front page news. Garvin's big problem, his ex-wife. The stockholders think they're sending those proxies to you at that post office box. Obviously, your ex-wife is acquiring proxies by tricking the stockholders. Why? To get control of the company. To break me if she can. Again, why? Hatred, greed. I think she cares more for money than anything in life. Garvin finds the gun the woman ditched on his terrace and then gets reprimanded by his business partners Frank Livesey and George Denby. Then Garvin sports off to lunch with his new wife. Dig this parting shot from Livesey. I hope Garvin knows where to buy his aspirin wholesale. Perry seeks out Garvin's ex and finds out they're not really exes in the States. Cue that charge of bigamy music. May I have the telephone number of the L.A. County District Attorney's Office, please? Bigamy is a felony, isn't it? Hey, it's the swingin' bigamist, baby! Perry has Garvin and his dubious bride skedaddle to Mexico. He knows a lady there, and that lady's hotel. It's the Vista del Mar. In Spanish, that's view of the sea. You don't see much sea from what we see of the place, though. Just the sort of soundstage thing. We do see that Perry's got a good relationship with the proprietor and that our man is heading south of the border, too. Señor May, say, muy buenas noches. ¿Cómo está? How are you, Philomena? Muy bien, gracias. What about my room? I give you the same one you have last time, number 16. That sounds wonderful. Ole! Well, all this is mere prelude to textbook Perry shenanigans. First, Mrs. Garvin, the first Mrs. Garvin, ends up dead. Second, Mr. Garvin gets arrested for the crime after a fake Della Street tells Mr. G and his wife to come back to the States. Third, we've got a La Jolla prosecutor, I guess San Diego if you're being kind, a man with a gigantic head that makes William Tallman look like William Hopper by comparison, if you know what I mean. This DA is just waiting for his chance to get at Perry's client's supposed alibi. We can save the time we'll need for extradition procedures and get to a trial as fast as we can. Are you offering a deal, Mr. Covington? Just testing your client's alibi. I'm afraid it's indestructible. Might be, we'll explode it. Garvin's wife claims Garvin couldn't have been in La Jolla killing his wife. She was right next to him in bed when the Vista Del Mar's chiming clock struck one in the morning. There's a problem, though. Mrs. Garvin said something about hearing chimes, didn't she? Yes. She didn't. Didn't what? Hear chimes. I just found out that Philomena is going to be called as a prosecution witness to testify that the chimes are turned off every night just after 10 o'clock so as not to disturb the guests. So, Perry plays hardball with the dubious Mrs. G. I tell you, I didn't leave the Vista Del Mar that whole night. I've got to hand it to you. I'm not very often fooled, but you did it beautifully. I don't know what you mean. When I first met you, I thought you really loved Ed Garvin. I do! 
He doesn't mean a thing to you. I should have spotted your motive immediately. With Ethel dead and Garvin on his way to the gas chamber, you'd get everything he has. In court, Perry confronts the saxophone-themed P.I. She's reluctant to reveal who her client is because, in fact, she's willing to go to prison to protect that client. So Perry plays hardball and she coughs up the name. It's... Frank Livesey. But when Perry figures out that it was our sax appeal P.I. who imitated Della Street and that she's serving not one but two clients, well, that leads to Perry confronting the real murderer. Isn't that why you killed her, Mr. Denby, to prevent that audit? How much money have you embezzled? You're making a terrible mistake. Am I, Mr. Denby? And do we have any real clarity about the marriage? Nope. We do get this joke about multiple Della Streets, though. Good times. I was intrigued when Mr. Garvin said there was another Della Street. I thought you were the only one in the world. A couple of notes about the 1949 novel on which this episode was based. Number one, according to to notes the writers of the show tried to adapt the case of the dubious bridegroom in season one and somehow came up with the script for the case of the prodigal parent you'll remember that episode it features fay ray and the despicable philip larkin take another look at that season one episode and try to figure out where things went sideways i can't quite make the math work number two the Case of the Dubious Bridegroom, the novel, has the same defendant, murder victim, and murderer as the episode. Good deal. Way to go, writers. You didn't have to change Earl Stanley's stuff. Number three, some differences, though. Virginia Bynum, that's the name of the attractive blonde in the novel, not a P.I. in the novel. Just a woman caught up with the novel's principal characters. Also, Livesey, Denby, totally in the background of the novel until the end, unlike the TV episode where the writers put them front and center. And in the novel, Perry conducts an illicit eyewitness test, which inadvertently reveals the murderer. There is also a rogue rancher who's had a romantic fling with the first Mrs. Garvin. It's a bunch of additional complications the writers thought it best to edit out. Now... Let's get trivial, shall we? Each episode in our trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul. Is this subject worth investigating more? Adela. Is something about a particular actor or actress who appeared in the episode? And a Perry? Well, that's something we learn about our intrepid hero. Our Paul for this episode involves a little thing they like to call Mexican divorce. It's supposedly quick and handy, though it has its drawbacks. And are you saying my Mexican divorce is no good? Well, that depends. If you followed the usual procedure mapped out several years ago by lawyers specializing in so-called Mexican divorces, it isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Yes, there's no doubt that divorces were granted in Mexico, but our Paul prompt for this episode. Was the so-called Mexican divorce actually a legal thing or an impolite fiction created for the benefit of this plot? Let me know what you find. Our Della for this episode concerns Joan Tabor, a.k.a. Virginia Colfax, a.k.a. Helen Bynum, a.k.a. Evelyn Whiting from the case of the substitute face. You're really very kind. The pride of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Tabor had a daughter by the age of 22 with a Chicago stockbroker named David Gold. She began acting. She divorced Gold in the 1950s and became part of something called the Hollywood in Chicago set, which... I didn't know it was a thing. In the late 1950s, she began showing up in a few Walter Winchell notices. Walter Winchell, the gossip column king. For instance, when she was dating actor Robert Horton in the years following her split from gold, 
She also shows up in a 1959 Walter Winchell item, which is posed as a question. Quote, are Raymond Burr and actress Joan Tabor planning a surprise? End quote. Well, if Walter's thoughts were that they were planning a romantic surprise, no, Walter, no, they're not. Unless the surprise involves arranging a saxophone quintet to perform the incidental music from Perry Mason at a Chicago opera hall. No, they're not. If you know, you know. Anyway, Tabor's acting credits mostly come from TV. Shows like Bat Masterson, Red Skelton, Laramie, 77 Sunset Strip, Laredo, etc. In late 1961, she started dating and eventually married Broderick Crawford. Broderick Crawford, at the time of their marriage, 50 Joan Tabor, at the time of their marriage, 30 years old, with a 7-year-old daughter. They get married in a little Baptist church in Las Vegas in 1962, and Tabor even appears on Crawford's show King of Diamonds. Then things start to go sideways. 1963, things get rough in court. David Gold, the ex, goes after custody of Tabor's child, his child too, claiming that Crawford and Tabor travel too much and that they have left Lauren, their now eight-year-old daughter, in a desperate state of loneliness. So, Joan Tabor quits show business. She claims one actor in the family is enough, and Crawford adopts Lauren. In 1965, just two years later, however, Joan Tabor filed for divorce from Crawford, claiming that Broderick struck and abused her. She gets that divorce. Then in 1966, Tabor dies at the age of 34, after an apparent overdose, are you ready for this, of influenza medicine. That's what the newspaper and autopsy reports. In the newspaper report, David Gold, the ex, says that he and Joan were working on a reconciliation. A tragic end for Joan Tabor. Our Perry for this episode involves our man's acquaintance with Philomena. Tell me, Philomena, were there any other nice figures at the hotel that night? Si, senor. After you go to bed, arrive another in taxi. I think maybe friend of you, but Philomena never asks questions. Never. Thank you, Philomena. I'm surprised we don't get any Spanish from our dude when he's down south of the border. I also like the nod, nod, wink, wink from Philomena concerning Perry's lady friend, where the implication is that something secret is going on with the character portrayed by Joan Tabor. Maybe she was the source that fed Walter Winchell that gossip item. Apparently, Della hasn't been south of the border with him. Who is this Perry Mason working late at night without Della, a man on a first name basis with a Mexican motel proprietress? Now he really is an international man of mystery. The theme of this episode is uncertainty. That's what I think the word dubious in the episode's title is meant to indicate. Mr. Garvin is an uncertain bridegroom because he just might be a bigamist. Well, let me point out two details here that add to this whole uncertainty vibe. When Perry describes Virginia Colfax, he says the following, and then Ed Garvin responds mysteriously. About 5'8", blonde, lovely figure, beautiful legs. Well, you're describing Lori. Lori? My present wife. Now, does anything about this description seem amiss to you? The new Mrs. Garvin is definitely not a blonde. Not even close. So why does Garvin say that Perry's description fits his new wife? Here's another puzzler for you, another source of uncertainty. Frank Livesey and George Denby 
are taking pot shots at Garvin after he leaves to go to lunch with his wife in the middle of a corporate crisis. And they have this exchange. Isn't love wonderful? I wouldn't know. Okay, so Frank Livesey's been in love. George Denby hasn't. All that's well and good until Paul Drake reveals this. What have you got on Denby? 49, married, no children. That's right. Denby is married. Say what? Dude's never been in love, and yet... Mm. Now, I bring up these apparent inconsistencies to say that every bridegroom in the show, in Perry Mason, two seasons in, has been dubious. We're now at the penultimate episode of season two. We're some 70 episodes in. There's one underlying source of unrest in Perry land. It's marriage. You can see why Perry and Dell only pretend to get hitched in the case of the deadly toy and don't even play around with the hint of an inner office romance. Note this word from the new Mrs. Garvin. I couldn't sleep. I hadn't slept in days. I couldn't go on that way anymore. Now she and her husband have only been married for a few weeks. Her supposed period of new wed bliss corresponds with her dark night of the soul anxiety regarding the former Mrs. Garvin. This is what it's like to be married in Perry's world. Congratulations on your recent marriage. Also, I'm very, very sorry. Let's hear a Perry proverb. Perry's talking to Mr. and the new Mrs. Garvin in the aftermath of the ex Mrs. Garvin's death. They assure him they have airtight alibis and as such are a bit flummoxed when Perry tells them to stay put in Mexico while he talks with the San Diego DA. They express their flummoxment, if that's a word, I just made it a word, and Perry offers his proverb in reply. You must realize the police are going to investigate you as routine procedure. They'll check your every move because of the relationship and the motive. This statement is an encapsulation of the stakes of the Perry world. Don't you understand? Perry is trying to tell Mr. And Mrs. Garvin, that the DA and policemen in this world, whether it be L.A. or San Diego, are incompetent, that the circumstantial evidence alone is enough to get one or both of you tried for murder, and that save for me, your intrepid hero, you would be headed for a conviction. Don't you understand? Well, even if they don't, Perry does, thank goodness. Now, let's grab a swig from the water cooler. There is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. Each episode in the water cooler, we begin by reviewing deleted scenes. You know, the comedic or serious scenes we would have liked to see in the episode that, for whatever reason, didn't make the final cut. This is the first time I've had a listener actually send in scenes. Tim Cree contributed the following two, one comedic, one serious, Number one, a scene of Perry telling Paul to figure out if someone can rig a giant hotel clock to ring at the wrong time or not ring at all, so as to confuse the time of crime by the sounds it doesn't make. I love it. Hilarious. And then number two, Perry has a chalkboard on the wall where he tallies the number of people who sneak onto his balcony. Let's hope the number stays at one. Yes, indeed, Tim. Serious and adroit. Great stuff. I'm going to add eight more. Number one, a montage of George Denby checking his answering service. Number two, the stockholders meeting held days after the general manager was acquitted of murder and the numbers man was arrested for the crime. Oh, by the way, you've got all of these proxies signed over to a dead woman. Eesh, that's not going to be a lot of fun. Number three, a flashback to Livesy in Love. Perhaps a spinoff series. Number four, the awkward conversation Garvin has with his wife about why he compared her to the blonde P.I. Virginia Colfax. Number five, the gas station owner's charming rapport with his customers. Hey, not so much windshield wiper fluid. You'll be getting a bill for $1.74. Hey, how many paper towels did you use in the gas station restroom? You'll be receiving an invoice for 37 cents. That guy. 
brought to you by the Wormy Council. Number six, at least one scene showing the fraternal affection between Garvin and his secretary. Come on, we got to see it. Number seven, the phone conversation between the San Diego DA and Hamilton Berger comparing notes on Mason's in-court MO. Hey, Hamilton, what does it mean when he asks to recall a witness? Is that a bad sign? Is it good or bad when he talks to Paul Drake in the middle of a cross-examination? Just sort of like trading notes. And then number eight, we got to get a serious conclusion to the bigamy charge wrap. Like, is that all okay now because the first wife is dead? They can just get remarried? Does it somehow blot out? Whether or not Garvin was guilty of the crime, season two has given us very few defendants in the office hanging out with the gang after the case, and I would have liked to see that part of the case closed. Our Paul from the last episode involved Felix Carr's humble brag about hand-rolled cigars. The little man that makes these for me in Havana refuses to accept the machine age. So we asked... Are hand-rolled cigars better than machine-rolled cigars, and why? Aunt Myra sent along an article that confirmed the basic implication that hand-rolled cigars are superior. I fell into the rabbit hole of cigar aficionado-affiliated propaganda and found this interesting excerpt from the Idiot's Guide to Cigars. It cleared the smoke surrounding the issue. Quote, The cigar-making machine made its appearance in about 1920. It rapidly gained popularity as manufacturers of nickel cigars sought to maintain low prices by replacing increasingly expensive manual labor with machines. Personally, I think life is just too short to smoke a short filler machine-made cigar. Even on a windy golf course that makes your cigar tip glow white hot it's more satisfying to smoke a cheap handmade long filler cigar than a cheapo machine stogie because handmade cigars are just that home handmade you'll occasionally find a loser even among the best cigars they may be rolled too tightly for a good draw have a spongy spot you might have overlooked or burn unevenly because the filler wasn't rolled just so but this is the price of buying a handmade product but you'll find that with the best brands, such mistakes are rare. Thank you, Tad Gage, who wrote those words in his 1997 book, The Idiot's Guide to Cigars. Yes, Felix was humble bragging. That guy is the worst. I've received some great emails from listeners over the past couple weeks. Lori wrote in to say, quote, I just discovered your fun and informative podcast. I wish I had a professor as entertaining as you. When I was in college, thank you so much for producing this podcast. It provides me with a much needed stress relief. Thank you so much, Lori. And this note from Maureen also made me happy. Quote, I just wanted to thank you for all the work that you put into every episode. My husband and I both love it. We started a nightly ritual a couple weeks back where we watch an episode of Perry Mason, then listen to the corresponding episode of the Perry pod. We have learned so much from listening to the podcast. I love the trivia and backstories on the actors of the show and was stunned when I learned that one of the defendants was Marion Ross of Happy Days fame. We looked up the article about the jockey defendant that you mentioned. Then recently I saw John Agar in a photo next to Shirley Temple at their wedding. And the article focused on the iconic wedding dress that Temple was wearing. But all I could think was, who cares about wedding dresses? That's John Agar, who was on Perry Mason. My husband, who has a great memory, loves the law library segment and the obscure legal terms you mentioned, such as race, just die. His day job is as a government attorney, so he's familiar already with many of the legal terms. End quote. That made my day. That's that's what I have to say about that. Maureen ended the note with an admonition for me to keep on walking that Park Avenue beat. Can we make that a thing? I'm trying to make it a thing. Let's make it a thing. We also heard from Trivia Maven and all-around Perry expert Nancy, who sent in these tidbits. The case of the dangerous dowager, actor Leo Gordon, a.k.a. Charles Duncan. He was actually in prison for armed robbery. And he was in the pilot of Gunsmoke. That's quite a twofer right there. And then from the case of the Spanish Cross, Nancy pointed out that Peter Miles, 
aka our defendant, had two sisters who appeared in other Perry episodes. Lauren Peru, who was Peggy Smith in The Case of the Nine Dolls, and Gigi Peru, who was in The Case of the Desperate Daughter, and Sleepy Slayer. Thanks so much, Nancy. As always, I'd love feedback about this particular episode or the podcast in general. Was there something about this episode you'd like to comment on, something you'd like to correct? You can email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find that address in the show notes. All Perrypod episodes are available via Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Please join us next time as we end Season 2 with the exciting case of the Lame Canary. Perjure Parrots, Lame Canary Season 2 of Perry is for the Birds. Join us, won't you? Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, Keep on walking the Park Avenue beat! Thank <laughs> you.